Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. In today's podcast, we're going to cover 10 great tips for web scraping. Hey everyone, it's Joe here from Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie here from Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah, today we're covering 10 tips for web scraping. And, uh, you know, web scraping, it, now to go on a side, short side tangent, an auto hotkey IE used to make it so easy for web scraping, but even everything we're covering here was, was relevant then, but it's also relevant now because they all basically leverage the DOM, the document object model. So the very first tip, ta da, is to study the DOM, study in the DOM in the sense of not just studying, like when you, when you go to evaluate a web page, but understand different aspects. So actually Jackie and I, it's a really good, I didn't think about it until now. The first time where I realized who you were, Jackie, was you helped me on the forum question. This is what, like five, six years ago now, somewhere in there. I had, I was doing some web scraping from a table and I was, I was using a regular expression. I was giving the entire table and writing a regular expression to parse it. And you're like, well, just loop over the table, you know, getting each row and each cell. And blah, blah, and I'm like, what? And you, you gave an example. And I'm like, what? I'm sorry, that's not in the documentation. What are you doing here? And you're like, well, that's just part of the DOM. This table is a DOM, and you can do these things depending on the structure of the DOM. And I'm like, what What in the world's a DOM? Um, and that was the very first one where I remember, who is this black holy man, you know, like person talking to me? And yeah, and then we, we you know, kept chatting more and more uh, over the years. But that studying the DOM, I can't reinforce that enough, right? It is so so helpful. There's so many different ways to access things and understanding the DOM is the key to to happiness and web scraping. Yeah, and it it really does follow into a lot of things because it will give you another level to understanding structured text, right? It's uh, HTML, JSON, or hotkey code, or uh, XML, whatever it might be, Becoming accustomed to looking at stuff like that uh, will help in in many ways. So yeah, studying the DOM, what's happening, what's a child to this one, what's a parent to that one. It can also help you later on when actually traversing all of this information. So yeah, I'd say that the next one we have is have a clear plan, right? Know exactly what you're getting. Of course, if you're just getting all of it, sure, do that. But if you actually want to get to that, I don't know, uh, username input field, um, or if you do want to get that address or whatever it is, by knowing exactly what you want, instead of just having that broad idea of, oh, I just want to get information about users or I just want to um, know something about this web page. It becomes very unclear, and that makes it hard to traverse something that's so structured. Right? It's, uh, it's a really good idea to have an exact plan of what you're getting. Yeah, and also I would say, because often web pages in particular have a lot of different information on them, so much more that you don't necessarily want everything. And that's where, depending if you're doing it for yourself or for a client, getting a very clear picture of what they're going to do with it uh, could really help you with that. And that takes us into the next one of, you know, even when your client, you know, you go through, let's say there's the fields are, you know, first name, last name, email address, website, company name, industry. And the person says, for whatever reason, I don't really care about their industry. Let's not capture that. You know what? (laughs) Just go ahead and capture it. Because if you have to get, let's say you looped over 50,000 pages and you got all this stuff, and then they go, hey, actually, you know what? I talked to someone else and they didn't want that. It's just easier to, you're already there, get the relevant stuff, you know, just put on your thinking cap and go, is, you know, why would they not want this? Let's go ahead and just get it. If we don't want to use it later, it's not a big deal. It's just, we're already here. We're already doing the hard work. Let's get a few of the extra pieces that make sense instead of making an executive decision up front saying there's no way I want this, right? Because often you'd be surprised, like things change. Yeah, and, and as long as you don't use an extensive extra amount of getting it, of course, but but uh, if, if you're there, as Joe said, you're right there, you just grabbed its sister or whatever it is, get that as well. 
there's probably no issue with that of course if if like joe said the amount of data you're collecting oh you're collecting thirty thousand million whatever mm, fair enough don't do it but other than that sure i'd say we the next one we have here is leap leapfrog to something right one of the things you often do is you try and get something it might not have an id it might not have something identifiable uh, in the structured uh, information but what it then often have uh, has is something that you can then traverse from so if let's say with the example joe had it's something that's inside a table and it's in the third row on the fifth column that cell alone probably doesn't have a unique ID. It might not have a class. It might not have anything that really sets it aside from the, the row or the cell just next to it. But by going to the table and knowing the rows, you could either jump to the right column or the right. You can simply traverse for something. So when you leapfrog to a specific title or a specific link, or something else on the page, you can simply just count elements from there. Yeah, and, and especially when you're only using elements, which we're going to talk about here in a bit, uh, it's it's highly unrealistic to try to do that in the with any consistency if you're not leapfrogging to some point because those things change a lot, right? Um, depending on what loads in the page and what's going on. But being able to jump down like that table probably has either a unique class name or an ID or something you can get to. And then everything from there, you start from there and even, hey, create a variable for that pointer to it. And your syntax is just that much shorter as well, right? It's just a nice, easy way to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, and then the other one, is, or another one is looking at your network traffic. Now this is one, and Jackie and I, boy, it's been quite a while since we did this, Jackie, for a, well, I won't say where, because they don't allow it. <laughs> yeah. So we, we were playing around on a site um, for practice. And uh, we were trying to do something, and it was really tricky with web scraping, but we realized they had API calls in the background that were being triggered. And because, especially at the time, it was really easy with IE to leverage your cookies from IE, we ended up not even doing um, web scraping per se, uh, I mean, they're both API calls, right? That's the confusing part. But we use the HTTP, no, actually, we use the XML HTTP request because that borrows your cookies automatically to do, and we connected to the frame and started sending them directly from the page and got all the data we wanted without navigating over these really big web pages. So use a tool like Fiddler or the developer tools to see what's going on. And often you can isolate what you're trying to do and just do API calls instead of the, the whole web page loading stuff. And it's much faster, much more concise. We have a really great webinar on API calls and talking about the differences between the two. Um, so check that out if you're not familiar with API calls. Yeah, that's a great one because one of the things that people might be familiar with is if you go and do a Google search, it will so show you 10 results. And at the end of that, you can say show more or go move to next page. And then it will either load it on the page or it will load an entirely new page. And what's actually happened is your click there actually does a call to the server asking for more information and if you just drop all of that page traversion and clicking and stuff like that and just do the call for the next page or the next piece of information you can really yeah jump heaps and loops over there uh, getting all of this stuff much more quickly um, the the sixth one we have here is begin um, parsing your your data locally right download and save the data in some way in variable file whatever um, so that you can actually work out your pace or uh, parsing on your local computer your local system then you're not hit by slow load times or other types of issues like that where uh, the browser isn't 
uh, acting as you would exactly hope right now or uh, something else like that or it keeps changing because oh now it loaded ads or whatever it might be uh, so so yeah uh, do that it's a good yeah. one. let me add on to that jackie because there's there's two that come to mind and one i didn't think about until you were just saying this it also stands to reason of like not just so the example here we're saying is go do the web call, save the response and save it locally. And then the reading of it's really fast. And you're also, let's say it actually costs you money or someone's monitoring what you're doing. And if you reload that page over and over and over, they may notice you're web scraping and block you, right? Which would really suck. So you can help with that. But another one, so it helps you with that part. It's faster, it's a little more efficient, prevents you from being blocked. But the second one is modularize your code so when you're working on that parsing you're not doing eight steps before it as well right unless they're required right and that's what i've seen a lot of people who go to debug something and they don't have an easy way to just pinpoint right here let me re retry this over and over and over and it's one of the best ways i can say is take take that little bit even if you put it in your own script or be able to use debugging tools to isolate it right in your script uh, it's so much more efficient and faster and easier to tell what's going on. It saves you so much time. It's worth learning how to do this because otherwise you waste a ton of time waiting for the system to get into a state that you're ready to test it, right? So that's what yeah. you're trying to avoid. Um, the next one, which is, and, and I think in my, I've described it as like when you, when you see frames, um, you know, I, I start crying a little and then I, I start working through how to solve it because they're, they're a headache. And what was really funny is like, and from talking to Jackie and Isaiah's Raptor X, you know, even Maestri and even Tank, like everyone was like, they're not fun. You know, like even I thought at the time I just sucked, which I, I, I'm not great, but no one thinks they're necessarily easy, right? Dealing with frames can suck. One great tip though is often if you look at the path to the frame, you can actually go load that URL directly. And once you've done that, it's no longer a frame. You're on the page, and you can do just like you normally do. Yeah, yeah, it, that that one is a great one, right? Navigate to the actual page. So if you have any way to dynamically or whatever is needed to getting the the URL of that frame, absolutely navigate to that instead and get your stuff over there, one hundred percent. The next one we have here is use multiple class names in your queries right no, not just one it it's a thing that came from um back in the day it seemed like our main tool our hotkey had um, mostly been used to traverse the dom right this element looping over finding another one that has the right string and stuff like that and then the, the newer uh, calm commands came into play and it was a lot of get elements by ID and stuff like that. It's very much one thing, one item, this is the way of doing it. And in recent years, uh, using class names for queries became possible. And a lot of our hotkey users, at least, had become accustomed to only using that single ID or that single string piece, whatever it might have been. Whereas, if you actually have access to use class names uh, in your queries, then you can combine them. It's a built-in method of that. Uh, and by remembering to do that, you can really make some strong queries into your uh, web page or HTML. Yeah, so to, to clarify, because um, it's just, if you use just one class name, it's a you know, class name, it's an array that gets returned, right? And so there's usually, especially when you just use one, more often than not, there's multiple instances of that class name on the page. But often when you use, you know, you separate them with a space in between your search and you ask for two or three, it's still an array, but often there's just one, right? And it's great if you don't have a name or an ID that's unique that you can jump to, using multiple class names as how you're identifying what you're trying to grab is a great way to, to get often... It's my go-to now. I don't even look for other stuff because it's my first one. I start there. Usually their multiple class names gives me what I want and that's what I use. 
Yeah, and over the years, class names has just become a much more used thing in building web pages, right? The, the dynamic uh, way of building pages today just utilizes class names much more than they did back in the day. Yeah. Which is a quick side note. That's one of the other things I was going to say was if you're new to uh, programming in general and automation and stuff, don't start with web scraping. <laughs> so the reason why is because, hey, you know what? If you study like the Excel object or let's say Outlook MS Microsoft COM objects, it's Jackie's version of Excel's COM object, you know, and mine are the same, right? They're, and you're using the same and everything. It's so simple. Every web page, you know, developers, the DOM is so wily and so different, and they use different types of methods and, and things to build them. It's what makes it so complicated to learn. And so it's where I started, and it was, whoo, it was tough because it's it, every page is different, and there's no set way. Here's your approach. You have to learn a lot of different things, again, studying the DOM, right? So, yeah, just, uh, just a heads up. Uh, yeah. Now, the next one, which is just one of those – it can really come back to bite you later if you don't do it. Study the data that you're gathering very closely because often you think you got what you wanted and and then you say, okay, go, and you start collecting all your data and then you you realize, oh, you know what? There was, you know, maybe there was um, an extra comma in the thing, like the, the names that I didn't want to have that I should have removed during collecting of the data or the date structure was actually done in a way I got a value, but I didn't realize... It was a timestamp instead of a the, the I just wanted the date or vice versa, right? It's just really pay close attention because there's you have to rerun everything to go back and and if it's not a lot of data, it's fine. But sometimes you're getting a lot of data and it's just very time consuming. So pay close attention. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a great one, right? It could also be you had traversed to the wrong uh, piece of data and. Uh, I've seen hidden elements, I've seen non-shown elements, I've seen all kinds of stuff where you think of oh, leave proc to this class name here and then two uh, elements down and it turns out that yeah you you got the first name but that was the one that didn't hold the full name right uh, the, stuff like that so yeah well, study your data at least before you you actually start the big scraping part I was going to say, Jackie, also, the really important thing to, to consider is unlike in like a public API, when you're doing an API call to an endpoint, you say, give me this, it'll be very, very consistent. A web page can often load one way, and the very next time you load it for a different thing, it'll load slightly different. They'll inject an ad, they'll do something else, and the things shift, right? And that's why you don't want to just look at the first one or two. Maybe look at a dozen and say, okay, you know, and, and jump around because it can, you can think you got it nailed and then there's something slightly different that you didn't have a random sample of things. And when you start looping over them, it actually shifts and suddenly you're like, crap, you know, there's actually some, it's more complicated than what I first realized. Yeah. And I've seen it with many things. It can be class names as well and stuff like that where, stuff will pop in and out depending on which system is actually building the web page is it generated from a specific type of back end and stuff like that so yeah absolutely study your uh, the data you're gathering closely yeah that's for sure and the next one is also don't fall in love with one method right it's it's there's lots of methods out there in, in just to name some, those get element by ID, get element by class name, get elements by tag name, and so on and so forth, and query selector or query select all, and all of those different ones. But it's just in general, don't uh, fall in love with one specific method. It's the same thing that Joe mentioned earlier with um, the XML request part, right? If, if it can be done with a different type of API, or if you can st not uh, traverse the DOM, or if you can red X this stuff out, or if you can, instead of going into the frame, actually just load the page, stuff like that. Just make sure you don't keep hammering at that one specific method, because you have so many uh, to choose from, 
and often it can be a good idea to just try and shift it around. Yeah, it's actually, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, we, 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 you and I stick often to auto hotkey for our coding, not exclusively, but we focus in it a lot. Um, but, and that's what I would say is like, which also why we're, we're open to using other languages if it's the right solution, right? But, you know, more often than not for the work that we do, auto hotkey is a great solution. It's yeah. just, hey, if I was doing some data science stuff, I probably would switch over to Python or R, you know, because auto hotkey is not the right solution for, you know, running through billions of rows of data. So um, it's just don't don't fall in love with one approach on anything and then whatever you're doing, right? I mean, it's, but yeah. it's very applicable because with web scraping, sometimes and Isaiah and I, we've been working on some stuff where he'll he'll want to do stuff and he'll say, "Oh, I'll just use a regex to to grab this." And I'm like, "Well, hey, I know the the JSON you know thing will load it into an object for me, and I can parse an auto hockey object very quickly." And and he's like, yeah, but the, the red checks thing is so fast. So we've actually done some videos showing the comparisons. And I'm like, okay, it is really, really fast uh, with how he did it. Uh, but so just the point being, be be ready to try different approaches because it can really save you both programming time, speed actually running, and complexities in your code. Yeah. All right, Vaughn. I hope you enjoyed. If, you, if we left any out that you, you think should have been this list, please chime in. I'd love to hear them. Yeah. Yeah, let us know. 100%. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah, bye. Hey, everyone. It's Joe here from Jack... <laughs> I'm here from Jackie.